In this presentation, we're going to examine x-rays, what they are, how they are produced, and also how they may use, be used for medical imaging. So let's start, first of all, with a character, characteristic image of an x-ray. Now, you're probably quite familiar with x-rays. They're quite used uh, in di diagnosing uh, breakages of bones. In this, and in this case, we have obviously a quite serious break. In fact, it is the break of a right femur. At the top, you see a person's pelvis and you see the ball uh, into the socket of the pelvis and the femur, the right femur most likely. You may just be able to make out the person's uh, soft tissue surrounding the actual break. Now in this case, what else you notice, of course, is that the image has variations in light and dark. And that means something in terms of x-ray, which, which we'll discuss. Well, how would they fix this? Well, in this particular case, a pin is used. A titanium pin may be inserted into the femur and held together by, metal, by screws. And it's quite obvious that this pin is much, much brighter than the surrounding bone. Again, that is significant. So what is, what is X-rays? Well, first of all, let's remind ourselves of the electromagnetic spectrum. An electromagnetic spectrum tells us the range of the type of wave called the electromagnetic wave. And of course, we classify this wave in a number of ways. First of all, it's a transverse wave. And this wave does not require a medium. And this particular wave is an oscillating electric field and uh, magnetic field. We are most familiar of course with visible light but that's only because our eyes are sensitive to a very narrow range of wavelength and frequency of electromagnetic radiation. And that's the key. Electromagnetic radiation has a range of wavelengths and corresponding frequencies. The longer wavelengths have a lower frequency and the shorter wavelengths have a much higher frequency. We're quite familiar also with radio, microwave and infrared, particularly in the use of communications. And they generally have a longer wavelength compared to that, that of visible light. At the other end of the spectrum, you have ultraviolet X-rays and gamma. They have an extremely high frequency and as a result, a much smaller wavelength. Now, X-rays was actually discovered by William Röntgen in 1895. And his discovery, of course, opened the way for learning a lot about the structures of the human body. X-rays are produced when electrons are fired at a metallic anode. And as they are fired at this metallic anode, they reduce, they lose their energy, which is converted into X-rays. And we'll explore that in a little bit more detail shortly. The type of X-rays is actually determined by the type of metal that is present. And so, for example, from a copper anode, the wavelength of X-rays are around 1.5 angstrom. Now, an angstrom is just a measurement of a unit. As you are probably familiar, a nanometer is 1 billionth or 10 to the minus 9 meters. An angstrom is 10 to the minus 10. So in this case, 1.5 angstrom is, is basically 0.15 of a nanometer. And of course, this wavelength can be used to determine the energy of a photon of an X-ray. In this case, the photon, in this case, is a value of 12.39 kilo electron volts. So how are X-rays produced? Well, here we have an X-ray tube. And this X-ray tube, of course, is basically a glorified version of a cathode ray tube. We have a cathode, which is our source of our electrons, and we have an anode, basically of where the electrons are attracted to when placed in a circuit across a, of which a high voltage is applied. In the middle of course you have another anode and this anode is basically where the electrons strike. Now the particular element that we are going to be referring to as, as opposed to, to the striking um, anode is tungsten. So here's a diagram of a Thermionic device, and as you probably remember from uh, previous studies, a thermionic device is simply a device that is heated, and as a result, the cathode ray releases electrons. 
and these electrons can be focused and uh, to be there uh, fired at the anode and then hit the, the tungsten target. It's a high voltage anode there needs to be a high voltage for the electrons enough to be liberated and to strike the tungsten target at an appropriate speed. And of course it's surrounded by a ga ga gas glass wall. The tube itself of course is uh, evacuated that is there is very little if no air whatsoever within the tube which obviously you do not want to have in there if you would uh, want the electrons to reach the actual target. And you have a a window and in this case you can see a beryllium window. I'll talk about that in a moment. Let's concentrate first of all on what happens when an electron or a bunch of electrons or a beam of electrons strike our tungsten. So here's our tungsten and it is at a particular angle and we have our electrons fired at it. Now what happens of course is when the electrons are fired at the tungsten they will produce x-rays which are scattered in a variety of directions. The important thing to note here is, is that the fact that the electrons strike the tungsten means that they are slowed down by the tungsten atoms. What does that mean? Well if they are slowed down they reduce in velocity and of course if they reduce in velocity they lose kinetic energy as well. Now as you know that this, en this loss of energy does not mean that uh, the energy is lost from, from the system. If there's a loss of energy in one place, there must be a gain of energy in another place. And in this case, a portion of the kinetic energy loss is converted to X-rays. And it's called the Bremsstrahlung effect. Now, that isn't the only source of X-rays in this particular situation some of the electrons within the tungsten actually are pushed into outer shells and that itself also produces some beam or some frequencies of x-rays though only a very small range of frequencies the majority of x-rays that are produced in this situation is through the Bremsstrahlung effect of course these, elect these um, x-rays are fired off in random directions and so you basically have x-rays fired in all ranges of directions. That's not very efficient. And so what you want to do is you wouldn't want to only capture or only utilize the x-rays in one direction. If you remember in the previous diagram there was a window or a beryllium uh, window. What that in essence does is simply allow uh, x-rays to pass through whereas the rest of the tube is coated to stop x-rays going through. We say that the x-rays are collimated. It's a very similar effect as if I were to basically put a box over a light bulb. The box blocks the light from escaping but if I place a hole in the box the light will escape but only in the direction of which the hole is applied. Of course the way that this collimated can vary you can produce a cone shaped beam or you can even produce a fan shaped beam depending on the nature of the window that is in the glass tube. However, as I've already, already intimated is that this whole system is very inefficient. For starters, only 1% of the electron's energy is actually converted to x-rays, which begs the question, what happens to the remaining 99%? Well, the rest of it is responsible for heating the anode. And of course, this anode can get quite hot as a result. The consequences, of course, of this is that because the anode gets so hot, you need to find a way of cooling it. And generally, what happens is the, the hot x ray tube is cooled with oil or water, whichever has a fairly high specific heat, or maybe even air. Also, the actual type of metal you use, in this case tungsten, has to be the, with a high melting point. You do not want the anode to actually melt from its uh, experience with production of x-rays. And so tungsten is used because it has a very high melting point. You may be familiar with the fact that tungsten is actually also used in most light bulbs these days. A voltage applied to a tungsten filament will cause it to glow white hot, but it is not 
hot enough to melt the tungsten and so the filament lasts for some time. Now as I've said it's very inefficient but of course as you understand too of all the exos that are produced a variety of uh, most of it is actually absorbed by the shielding with only a very small percentage of the x-rays that are produced going through the window in other words the collimation and so as you understand a very high voltage has to be applied to produce even just a small amount of x-rays that could be utilized that brings to the question of well what are the types of x-rays that are produced in this sense there are two types of x-rays hard and soft before we look at the specifics let's have a look at the range of electromagnetic radiation up top of the scale is our gamma radiation and then the bottom we have very long frequencies or extreme log frequencies which are basically what we would refer to as your radio waves though your radio waves in this scale is in the UHF VHF and HF band and you have longer frequency uh, longer wavelengths even below that the numbers look all the same but if you look carefully enough it's the prefixes that give away the fact that there is a great size differential and so for example you can see that the wavelength for gamma radiation is one picometer or 10 to the minus 12 meters as you go down the scale the wavelength increases and down the bottom you'll see one megameter similarly speaking the frequency is high at the top and very low down the bottom and according to uh, quantum theory of course that the energy is determined by this frequency e equals hf and so you'll notice that each particular or each class of electromagnetic radiation has a various energy value down the bottom you'll see 1.24 pico electron volts which is extremely small however gamma radiation has a very high energy level 1.24 mega electron volts now if we examine this scale and we just examine the top section you will notice that the top three are gamma hx and sx that is essence means the hard x-rays and the soft x-rays and you will notice first and foremost that the hard x-rays have a higher frequency a smaller wavelength and as a result a higher energy level as to that of soft x-rays so hard x-rays have a high frequency and energy as a result they have a higher penetration ability because these photons have more energy they can penetrate whatever they're going through at a much greater level this is important in terms of x-ray imaging it basically means you can produce better image resolution however the consequences in order to produce these high frequencies very high voltages are applied to them to, to produce them it's not as if you can buy your local x-ray tube and plug it into your 240 volt power supply soft x-rays however have a much lower frequency and energy as a consequence they have a lower penetration ability making them poor for the use of imaging because their resolution is poor of course as a result the voltages that are required to produce them is lower so which would you use hard or soft well obviously the, the best choice in this case is hard x-rays if you want better resolution I mean that's why we are using x-rays in the first place but there's another reason why hard is used over soft x-rays soft x-rays are slower and as a result it does not take much for the x-rays to be not only slowed down or, uh, but to be absorbed by the tissue and so because they can be absorbed by the tissue this leads to possible risks such as cancer and other damage and so when x-rays are produced in the x-ray tube you're going to have a range of hard and soft x-rays produced you want to filter out the soft x-rays and only allow the hard x-rays to pass through the actual window in this case aluminium is often used and aluminium will absorb out the soft x-rays however aluminium allows the hard x-rays to pass through and so therefore you are not exposed to soft x-rays when you have an x-ray scan done now x-ray images come into two forms 
But before we talk, I discuss about the two types of forms, let me just remind you of how x-rays may be used in imaging. The first thing to note about these types of x-rays, the ones that we are most familiar with, is that they are two-dimensional. That is, the x-ray beam comes from one side, so it's linear. And so, being two-dimensional, you do not get an idea of a three-dimensional structure. The x-rays pass through the subject, and the amount of x-rays that are absorbed will determine how much actually reaches the photographic plate on the other side. And so you may find that either a hard structure may absorb the actual x-ray, or it may be a number of hard structures that produce a similar type of result simply because they are in line with the x-ray beam and therefore absorb the x-rays. And I'll explain that a bit more further in a second. First of all, let me have a look, let's look at these two different images. You'll notice that there is a difference between the two styles of images, even though they are produced really much the same way. The first way is the light mode. And in this particular x-ray image, it's actually quite a historically significant image. It's actually the hand of William Röntgen's wife, the first x-ray ever made. And the large object that you see on her finger is actually her wedding ring. In this case, the film is black, and its exposure to x-ray causes it to be whitened. So obviously, areas that are white means it's had lots of exposure to x-rays. And areas where there is darkness, it's basically getting very few x-rays. And that is, of course, determined by the density of the material. And so it's obvious that bones, being highly dense, will absorb a lot of x-rays, and therefore prevent the x-rays from striking the photographic plate and hence they are on the, uh, they, they appear dark. Obviously the lighter the image, the more x-rays that pass through and therefore lesser, the lesser the density. We're obviously more familiar also with the x-ray mode. In this case, the image is reversed. The film is white, but is blackened by exposure to x-rays. And if you look carefully, in this case, the image was taken because a person had broken his clavicle. Okay. Now, in this case, it's black because it's been exposed to x-rays. And you'll find that aspects of the arm bone, or correctly known as the humerus, uh, varies in light and darkness. It's lighter down the centre because the bone, in, in essence, is hollow, so some x-rays pass through. The edges, of course, are thicker in respect to the way that x-ray passed through the uh, person and so as a result it actually is lighter. The white mass to the bottom left of the image is the sternum. Now the sternum is a thick bone and so you would expect it to absorb a lot of x-rays hence leaving the, the film white. The middle section isn't because that particular bone there is any more dense it's simply that there's simply more bone three-dimensionally in that respect because the bones curve around and so as a result a lot of x-rays are being absorbed and so it, it does not necessarily give you a lot of information about bone density unless of course the, the, the bone was spread evenly across the, across the plate. Nonetheless it's still useful in diagnosing particular breaks and that's the important thing to, to understand that X-ray imaging is used to determine uh, structure of hard tissue. So we're particularly looking at bone, cartilage and so forth. But pretty um, ineffective in terms of soft tissues. So for example, inside the cavity, chest cavity, there would be blood vessels, and there would be lung tissue, there would be heart muscle tissue such as the, the heart and so forth. However, their densities are relatively the same even though they are very different tissue types. And as a result, you do not get the detail by using x-rays alone. To get those details, you would need other forms of imaging, which is covered in another part of the course.